Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to our special EdTech session in collaboration with our new corporate member, D2L, Desire to Learn. I represent the Indo-Canadian Business Chamber as its CEO. The Chamber is a premier organization based in India, which is dedicated to promoting Indo-Canadian economic and bilateral relations. The Chamber works closely with the High Commission of Canada and India on core issues and initiatives related to bilateral trade in the India-Canada business corridor. We have a pan-India presence and excel in forging economic partnerships across sectors. Today's session on leveraging on digital transformation for a progressive education ecosystem is very pertinent, considering the systemic changes that are developing in the educational sector in India. The recent announcement of the national education policy suggests multiple developmental plans, which would essentially require partnerships at the highest levels. All this to enhance student learning and growth, administering better automated systems for schools and colleges. To deliberate on this subject, we have an excellent panel here today. But firstly, please join me in welcoming Ms. Lindsay Marginaux, Councillor and Senior Trade Commissioner at the High Commission of Canada. Lindsay manages Canada's trade and investment program in North India, Nepal, and Bhutan, and is a Deputy Commercial Program Manager for all of India. She joined the Canadian Foreign Service in 2003 and has served abroad in several roles in important missions like China and United States. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us today. I now request you to please make your remarks. Over to you, Lindsay. Thank you, Nadira, and good morning, everyone. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here. Uh, I just want to start off by thanking the Indo-Canadian Business Chamber for bringing us all together today for this really important discussion. Um, as Canada's commercial counselor in India, my role is to help India and Canada do business together. Our two countries have a lot in common, uh, including our really strong commitment to education and to educational cooperation. So I'm here today because this is a really important discussion for us in Canada. In 2019, so just last year, out of a total of more than 600,000 international students in Canada, more than 35% of them came from India. Uh, more than 200,000 international students, Indian students came to Canada last year. And we are seeing signs that it's only gonna increase this year in spite of some of the challenges. Uh, international students contribute a ton to the Canadian economy um, and they support uh, over 200,000 jobs across Canada just by being a uh, part of our community. So it's a really important piece of our bilateral relationship to exchange these students. Um, in addition, we have a number of Canadian universities and colleges who are collaborating with their Indian counterparts uh, for joint research and development programs and faculty exchanges. So over 550 of these sorts of MOUs and cooperation agreements are, are in operation across all different kinds of fields. But as you all know, the current challenges I think that we're facing uh, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, um, both in Canada and in India, has significantly reduced student mobility and the ability for people to move around and do these sorts of educational exchanges. What that has caused in Canada, I think is similar to India. Um, we are seeing most of our colleges and universities explore online learning options as a strategic response uh, to the demand that they continue to have uh, for students to access their education. Um, even in the K-12 learning environment, uh, most Canadian schools, our, our regular public school system, has to have in place uh, uh, the option for students and teachers to go online possibly even at a moment's notice. Um, many of them are in various stages of remote learning due to specific COVID outbreaks or, um, or other issues that they're encountering. Um, so there's a lot of potential, I think, for, uh, for, for Canadian experience uh, in terms of this, this digitization of education uh, to influence India. India, as you know, has the world's largest education system with over 250 million students uh, enrolled in over 1.5 million schools across India. Um, that's huge. Uh, you're the second largest market now for e-learning after the United States. And I expect with just the volume of students here, things are going to increase quickly. And India offers a lot of opportunities um, for providers of technology to, uh, to scale up in a, in a very, very user-friendly environment. And from my perspective, we see the Indian government working really hard 
to adapt to this new global reality and to provide a policy environment to support it. So examples like the national education policy, um, which include an emphasis on digital literacy and the new national education technology forum uh, to help facilitate the creation and adoption of online learning um, and possibly even provide funding for that. Uh, these are great steps. And I think that it's very clear that India will be the world leader in digital education within the next 12 to 18 months. So the policy is in place, the need is there. And I think that there are great examples of cooperation and collaboration already happening between Canada and India. We're learning from each other. So this is a really good time for me to be here and for all of us to be looking at this exciting space. And I, uh, I look forward to hearing from our speakers on uh, the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. That was really informative, and uh, you know, and your uh, uh, and as you said that I think India is going to be the largest in digital education learning. So we look forward to that. Um, next, I would like to welcome the panel moderator, Mr. Rontu Basu. He is co-founder of Quest Partners and also a national board member of the Indo-Canadian Business Chamber. Rontu has led several India entry strategy assignments across education, media, publishing, food technology and other industries. He has also been the India country advisor to the Shulik School of Business, York University, Toronto, since 2005. Rontu, may I please request you to take this forward to introduce our esteemed panelists and start the session. Thank you, Nadira. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the EdTech webinar hosted by CBC. As uh, my name is Rontu Basu and I'm your moderator for this morning. Uh, this is indeed the age of ed tech, as a recent uh, business magazine report highlighted. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated uh, digital transformation in education, as educators have been forced to think outside uh, classroom size boxes uh, to ensure continuity with education while quarantines, you know, force students to uh, uh, stay away from schools and colleges. With it, uh, I believe the growth of uh, ed tech innovation, as well as access to online courses and digital content has exploded. Institutions of every size and variety and type are now experimenting with various ways to teach and learn on the internet. The pandemic has managed to fast forward many technological uh, changes that uh, till now were on the drawing board. Uh, according to reports, uh, the global digital education market is expected to grow almost fourfold from I think US dollar 8.3 billion to about US dollar 33 billion uh, from 2019 in five, six years to in 2024, it should touch about 33 billion. So that's, that's a huge exponential growth, which is expected from the sector. Here in India, India's leading ed tech app, Baiju's, which most of you are aware of, ranked among the world's top 10 most downloaded apps during the lockdown. Current trends indicate that uh, digital learning will be an integral part of educational uh, uh, institutions in the post-COVID world. And taking note of this, the big institutional investors, B funds and venture funds are uh, making a beeline for the sector. And Baiju's, of course, and a few others in India have been beneficiaries of that. As uh, Lindsay mentioned, you know, we are already the second largest market for e-learning after the US. And according to India Brand Equity Foundation, this sector is expected to touch about $2 billion, which is about 15,000 crores by 2021. So these are some stats which seem to suggest that the, the sector is uh, set to grow and is exploding. And to discuss all uh, this uh, uh, very topical uh, issue, uh, we are joined by an eminent panel, and I'm not going to spend too much time introducing the panel in detail because all of you have received the, their bios and the invitation. So let me begin by uh, uh, welcoming Vanita Segal, Executive Director of DPS Society, for whom teaching has been a passion for over 38 years. Next, we have Professor Anil Sasharbude, the highly decorated chairman of AICT who has held this role since uh, July 2015. Dr. Biswajit Saha, Director CVSE Board, who has been part of various national and international committees for the holistic development of education uh, in this country. Anuj Basin, the ever smiling uh, Trade Commissioner, Education, High Commission of Canada, who I've known for a very long time. And Nick Hutton, uh, Regional Director for Asia, Desire to Learn, D2L, which created Bright Space 
the learning platform that is recognized globally as the number one uh, LMS or learning management system technology for next gen online teaching and learning. So each panelist will uh, give their opening remarks for five minutes, post which we will dive into Q&A and also take questions from the web chat. So I'd like to begin by inviting uh, Vinita Saigal to give her opening remarks, uh, followed by Dr. Shashupate and Dr. Saha, um, Anuj, and finally Nick. So may I begin with Vanita, please? I think you're on mute, mute Vanita. Okay, China? Yep. All right. Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting me. Um, my tenure as principal of DPS Arkhipuram uh, ended on 31st March this year. And uh, before that, about 10 days before that, the country went on a lockdown. And um, I had all these years been telling everybody that I did not want a farewell, grand farewell when I left. But in my wildest of dreams, I did not imagine that when I left an institute where I had been for more than 36 years, I would only have two people waving me goodbye. I drove down through the empty streets of Delhi and I told somebody when I reached home, I feel like I'm in ghost town. It's so spooky. There's nobody there. And then a few days later, I was in this numb state of mind and not knowing what to do. And I got an invitation from my staff members who had an online farewell uh, organized for me, all very quietly, privately done. And there was music, there were songs, there were speeches. And of course, the best part of it was they invited my family, my sisters and their families in the US to join in. It would not have happened if it was a life uh, function. Technology is something I have criticized that it isolates people. I feel that everybody should be face to face. But during this lockdown, I think I've realized that technology has even brought the world closer. I'm meeting more people. I'm interacting with people that I didn't think I could all across the world. And of course, the fact that we are at this phase in um, the world's um, scene that where everything is at our fingertips makes it so much simpler. We, can, we have sports, we have entertainment, we have education, we also have politics and we don't have to step out at all. Just like right now. When it started, when the lockdown started in school, I was still principal and I remember calling the teachers and saying, well, the last second last Monday was I think March 23rd and I said, you have five days in which to prepare and you go online. These were teachers who had been scared to use smart boards. These were teachers when told to make PowerPoint presentations had said they could not do it. In five days, with just maybe one hour of training or two hours of training on Monday 23rd, they went online. I cannot tell you how proud one feels to see my teaching faculty. And this is not just my school. I'm talking of my school. I know it happened all over. How well they sort of adapted to it at a time when the world was scared I think it's the teachers who brought a semblance of normalcy to every, to every household. I had, of course, taken over as executive director of the HRDC of the Delhi of, uh, DPS Society. And um, I thought that since I could not have people coming in for workshops, I was going to have this very cushy time and a relaxed time after 36 years of working. But then I was called up by our, my, the chairman of DPS Society, Mr. Shimlu, and he said, start observing the online classes. So from April to September, we observed, we made a team and we observed our 220 schools, which are all over the country. I was amazed. I, I was really amazed because we have schools in places I hadn't even heard of. I mean, I had not heard half the names of those cities and I watched those teachers doing such a great job of online teaching. Of course, in the first few instances, there were some very amusing incidents which took place when the teacher um, told the class of fifth or sixth grade, as I forget. And um, she said, can you please, uh, one of you start the recording? And uh, the little kid said, ma'am, we can't start it. It's in your hands. Mm -hmm. Two months down the line, when I watched the teacher's class again, there was this confidence that had not been there before. Um, of course, what has really helped is the fact that there is so much out there in the world. There were so many websites that the teachers could go to for, for the tools. Um, in India itself, we have, uh, we have portals like Diksha, which these teachers have used. And um, of course, what also is very, really amazing is things like um, augmentation, things like virtual reality, which we talked about, was now being used in the classes. And in addition, of course, schools have conducted exams, competitions, functions, everything is online. So basically, it's only the school buildings that are closed. Schools are still open. 
Since I'm in charge of teacher training of the DPS Society schools, um, I was told that uh, start the teachers training. And this was again like, like how do I start it off? So the, you know, I, the chairman said, do webinars. From June to right now, we have conducted about 40 webinars. And in almost all the academic subjects, we have also touched upon things like counseling. We brought in experts to talk about adolescent stress management. We have had um, art integration. We have music, dance, theater, storytelling sessions. We've had um, uh, teachers coming online and sharing the teaching experiences. We have also linked up with a school in the, uh, in the USA uh, in which where the biology teachers actually shared their experiences there of teaching and our teachers shared theirs with them. Right now we have a lot more sessions coming up and uh, we have panel discussions for the teachers. So this is 220 schools that I'm talking about all send one representative each for each webinar. I've touched thousands. I don't think I could have managed it if it was just a physical um, workshop our seminar taking place. Um, though, of course, I would like to add here, this was not something new for our um, society. Two years ago, Mr. Shulu uh, had suggested that we had told us that we need to do online classes for the schools which were in smaller areas and which needed some kind of expert guidance. Of course, as usual, when you do something new, you're always complaining. And we had sort of put up all obstacles on the way, which did not work. And we did have classes, key teachers for two years have taught online, virtual classes and where the our um, brother sister schools have come online and watch these classes and this has been in physics maths and english and of course the teachers who conducted these found the online classes uh, much simpler to conduct uh, but there is going to be again a huge paradigm shift the future cannot lie in the school classroom alone i think we've realized that blended and flipped classes are here to stay Teachers will, of course, have to decide how much they will teach in the class, how much the student will do on their own, and how much they will do in a group. And for this, of course, schools need to be much more technically sound and technologically superior. And uh, I have full confidence that the teachers and the schools who brought the classrooms to the homes of each child will now open the doors of the world to the same ch children through digital transformations. Thank you. Mr. Bosho, please unmute. I said, thank you, Vinita. I said, uh, uh, it was interesting to hear that uh, uh, the school, only thing closed for the school buildings, everything else was functional. Everything was functional. That's great. Uh, can I invite the now Professor um, Sasha Budde for his opening remarks and his thoughts on the subject? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very thankful to indo canadian Business Chamber for inviting all of us here. Madam uh, Lindsay, Gontu, Nadira, Anuj Bhasin is sitting at the back end, and uh, Dr. Nick is going to speak a little later, and my co-panelists, uh, Vanita, Vishwajit Saha. I think it's a very exciting time during this COVID-19 uh, crisis. Many things which uh, we were planning, we're not able to execute. We are literally forced to do that, and uh, part of that story was told already by Vanita just now about the school education. When it, it comes to the higher technical education, we are a little better geared up for that because, because of technology that is being used quite often in the technical institutions. We were not taken a, this whole thing as a shock, but there were institutions who had to struggle a little bit for about 15 days, one month. But nevertheless, most of the activities started online immediately after the lockdown was started in the March uh, last week. I think that is one part of the education. Similarly, for conducting examinations online, there are several tools which were available. No one was using them because we always believed that proctored examination inside the classroom with the invigilator running around is the only way of conducting examination. I think we have moved away from that and technology has enabled us. And not only that, probably it is more effective than the invigilation done in the classroom. Because in the classroom invigilator moves around, when he's uh, at the backside, someone in the front will be doing something. Whereas the camera will catch every small bit of detail when an examination is conducted in an online mode. I think that is another way of uh, looking at technology. The third one which I would like to refer to is about the teacher training, uh, which is very, very significant and important. 
we were holding faculty development workshops of one week duration, sometimes two weeks duration in the face-to-face -face mode. And uh, we could only invite about 50 of them. Now with the pandemic, because we were not able to conduct such uh, faculty development workshops, we were forced to have online, uh, whether it is using WebEx, whether it is using Microsoft Teams, whether it is by using Google, whether it is using Zoom. I think we graduated to various types of platforms and in every workshop, we started off initially with about 100, 200 only. And then we have found that even some of the workshops can be held with 1,000 faculty participating. It was an amazing thing. We were initially thinking that when people are in large numbers in an online world, we will not be able to control who is learning, who is not learning. And that is one of the doubts which everyone has in our minds. But my take on this is even in a classroom mode, if the mind is vibrating around somewhere outside, probably he's not learning anything in the classroom as well. Whereas if someone is committed to learn something in an online mode, he will be gravitated towards the computer and will listen to every bit of it. Uh, that is what uh, bits and bytes we talk about in, in the digital technology. Each one of those bytes he will be able to receive. Them. I think that is what we, we experimented. And one simple example is we started teaching uh, faculty about new various types of technologies which are emerging, which have been added in the curriculum like AI, IoT, machine learning, deep learning, 3D printing, robotics. We have uh, blockchain, augmented reality, virtual reality. This is part of the curriculum, but faculty themselves were not trained earlier. So in last one and a half years prior to pandemic, when we conducted such courses, we were able to train hardly 9,000 faculty with 185 workshops. In just the five, last five months in the pandemic period, we had 400 plus workshops and trained 100,000 faculty members. And each one of them gave test examination and we have certified them. I think this is a big transformation and change that has happened. The last one, which is also significant and important because we are a regulator, a technical education regulator. We had a practice of uh, calling institutional, whatever leaders to the uh, AI city office, either in the headquarter or the regional office for giving permissions to start the institutions uh, for the new institutions and for continuing of the institutions, we had an approval process, which was all going to be face-to-face -face all these years, last 30 years. And we were trying to change, but no one was ready to change. They were always giving some alibi. But this time, because of pandemic, there was no possibility of meeting each other, going to the institutions, traveling, and then visiting the campuses and inspecting. We transformed every bit of it using Microsoft Teams and much more robust. Because in a, in a physical inspection, there were many times allegations that an institution uh, which was being inspected will say that the inspectors who came, they were asking for some favors. And now everything is recorded on, on camera. So no one can deny something or accept something. So I think uh, this is a very powerful use of technology. We have given approvals to about 300 new colleges some of the older colleges which had some problems or additional inputs required, we have all given them online approval, everything online. So absolutely no visit at all. We have reduced the travel time, we have reduced the costs, we have reduced everything and increased the transparency, increased the authenticity of what we are doing. I think this is the power of technology. I can go on and on about various other experiences, but I will come back later when there are some questions asked on these platforms. And of course, uh, the new national education policy also empowers in terms of uh, the number of credits being transferred to the transcripts from SOEM platform, which is the MOOCs platform, is increased from 20%, which existed the last two years, to now 40%. So a lot of online is going to happen. And although all of you are saying that India is the second largest country using online education, I bet on it, in a year's time, we will be the first highest one in the whole world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. I absolutely agree with you. We will be number one very shortly. So uh, very interesting. You touched upon the, um, a couple of uh, uh, things which have happened through technology and has, uh, been, you've been able to deliver it better. You touched upon teacher training. That's about 400 plus workshops that you've conducted uh, over this period, which is quite amazing. And of course, most importantly, the transparency in the inspection and approval process. Uh, which uh, I think this technology has brought about, which I, I think is amazing. Uh, and I think uh, you need to be applauded for that. Thank you so much. Uh, can I now move on to Dr. Saha, please, to, uh, for his comments. Uh, Dr. Saha, please unmute. 
Uh, thank you, Rantuji. Uh, uh, respected uh, Chairman AICT, um, other co panelist uh, Benita Ji, Neek, uh, Anuj Basinji, and of course, Lindsay, and CEO of uh, ICBC. It's a great occasion to uh, share some of the initiative taken by Central Board of Secondary Education, especially during this pandemic period. The power of technology is accepted by every individual in the country, and especially for Central Board of Secondary Education, uh, we actually geared up again, uh, certain terms will be repeating because in terms of teachers training, uh, huge um, changes uh, we are able to make during this pandemic times. Again, go with the um, uh, chairman of ICT SIRS boys. Here, earlier, we used to complete hardly 100,000 to 200,000 um, teachers training in a year, physical teachers training. But from April to uh, October, even today also, the multiple sessions are uh, there, uh, are, which are being conducted by our 16th center, uh, center of Excellence. So we are able to touch upon more than 500,000 teachers during these pandemic periods. And that's the power of technology, rather embraced by all the teachers. And now another interesting fact is Diksha, which is being conceptualized as a one nation, one platform. And under PM EBITDA programs, we are trying to gear up for the entire nation. Uh, Mr. Rontu has mentioned about the Baiju's platform. If you look into our own indigenous platform, the heat rate is much, much ahead of uh, every other private player. So that, that's the initiative that many of our schools teacher, many of our parents and students, it's a huge repository. And interestingly, let me also tell this initiative, of course, the technology is on the one side and other side, the people participation. Banitaji Benita, uh, is very much here. So her school teachers and many other schools teacher, they openly donated their executive content to this platform by name of Biddadan. And so these Biddadan or donations of knowledge becomes a movement here in India. And in this pandemic times, rather a lot of platforms, we are trying to capture the quality contents and remove the old content which are partially not relevant. So we are getting that concept of removing and adding with the help of AI and different use cases. So that's the uh, power, one way people are trying to understand. Of course, challenges are there, but uh, with the government initiative, both state and union uh, initiative, we are trying to minimize that gap also. So again, to repeat, uh, under PM EBIT, the programs, the 12 dedicated channels uh, under school educations uh, will be there. And for class-wise, grade one to 12, the different programs will be telecasted, both in English and Hindi medium, as well as vernacular in other regional uh, medium. And, ba and based on those outcomes, these links would also be available in Diksha so that the content coherence and the technology co coherence we are trying to establish so that stakeholder, because these pandemic times, of course, uh, is, is a kind of things where homeschooling is being um, channelized in a way, and that power of homeschooling, we try to capitalize, and especially for the inclusive children, the children with special ability, they are getting the utmost benefit, like all, all normal kids. So one way these issues are being uh, covered, and other way, we are of course trying to how the assessment and other parameter, because theoretical learning is, of course, it is easily doable, but what about the lab-based activity, project-based learning? So even we are thinking how we can create virtual lab. And of course, um, thanks to Government of India and especially uh, METI uh, with their support and especially CDEC and Amrita Bishad, the uh, uh, university supports, we are able to create O-labs. 
where the student can easily perform physics, biology, and chemistry, and all science-related activities by sitting on their terminal. So that's the power we are trying to leverage upon across the school without um, putting any, any sort of barricade. And otherwise, uh, the different way, as um, um, Chairman ICT sir has mentioned, even at C uh, CBSC, again, as we are affiliating schools, the inspections component is a very much um, sensitive area. So again, with the power of technology, we are trying to mitigate. And in fact, in fact, the many of our um, principal are comfortable nowadays to do virtual inspections. And we are also happy. And even from the side of the new schools, they are also happy because more transparency is visible. At the same time, as uh, we are aiming for the blended and flip model thereafter, uh, the challenge would be that one is, of course, digital divide uh, and more technology player and low cost technology uh, variations is uh, really the need of the hour. And number two, all the teachers community, as if uh, by taking the pandemic challenge, they have uh, attributed a lot, but at the same time, we need to understand the children's psychology they are on screen time and mental well being. And uh, the last one is cybersecurity because the lot of image data we are capturing with the help of technology. Maybe certain freebies are there, but systemic protocol is need to be developed, uh, which will later on govern the future technology use case. So these are the challenge we need to look into. At the same time, we want that low cost technology should be available in India so that every household even those who are not have, uh, availing the smartphone, they can easily use with the help of radio, TV, and of course, the internet medium. Thank you very much. The later on, I'll touch upon the other point if there is any. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. So, uh, Dr. Sir, uh, you touched upon the power of technology and you said uh, your teacher training, the numbers from 100,000 have jumped to 500,000, which is quite amazing. Uh, you also mentioned something which I didn't know that the Diksha app has a hit rate higher than Baiju's, uh, which is again a very interesting uh, thing to understand. And also the fact that uh, teachers have donated their time and knowledge uh, to upgrade the platform uh, voluntarily to make it much more relevant uh, to today's day and age and the virtual lab. Uh, those are quite uh, interesting uh, uh, things which have happened uh, uh, in these seven or eight months under the lockdown. Thank you so much. Uh, can I now bring in uh, Anuj Basin uh, uh, for his remarks on the Indo-Canada Education Corridor? Anuj. Thank you. Thank you, Rontu. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking ICBC for organizing such an engaging dialogue. And uh, obviously the eminent panelists have shared uh, their views, which are very pertinent. So it's sort of, you know, very less genuine value add that can I add, uh, I can add to it. But primarily if I, you know, take a step back and say the bilateral relationship between Canada and India that Lindsay touched upon on during her opening remarks, typically there is, you know, a bilateral MOU that we have between Canada and India that look at, you know, sort of developing a framework. We talk about, talk, uh, you know, looking at Canada as a study destination, five-fold increase over the last five years, numbers going through the roof. Uh, Canada and India as strong academic partners. The key opportunity with the edtech space is to expand this ambit of partnership beyond academics and look at as a service provider for each other. And primarily, if I look at the learnings from the Canadian or the North American ecosystem, partly uh, the expansion to online and flexible learning has happened because of the COVID-19 outbreak. But it has, it's been a process that has been going on for a while, simply because the response for the access to education, which uh, Mrs. Segel also touched upon, is very much there. So as governments around the world reduce funding in higher education, despite the rising costs of offering quality learning, we find a lot of post-secondary institutions and even K-12, they have to expand online. In Canada, if I put a number to it, they are growing at approximately 10% per year. 
while face to face registrations are more or less plateaued they the plat uh, i mean ontario uh, uh, as a largest province leads with a 14% growth and compare it with india mooc registrations also continue to grow primarily because of the growth in india and africa and we have these mooc based degrees as well as uh, nano credentials this uh, helps in reskilling the workforce in the light of the challenges uh, of the nature of work as a result of technology many provinces or state governments in canada uh, are looking at uh, universities and colleges offering micro credentials which can be stacked and transferred into more substantive degree and diploma programs so you integrate a bit of uh, elements again uh, professor sarswati mentioned uh, during his remarks that even aict is encouraging a lot of engineering colleges to offer fixed percent of learning through online education and that is something that is happening in canada canadian companies work very cl closely with the academics to deliver workplace learning development for credential so upskilling in the corporate space corporate learning space very very relevant in this time of pandemic we've had cases of layoff so it's about reskilling ourselves into the areas which are in demand Uh, be it ai be it uh, blockchain you know uh, and whichever that niche is and the best part with you know the solutions like say for example what d2l offers uh, specifically the learning management system there's a personalization or a customization element attached to it which produce very strong learning outcomes where in different students who enroll in the same course may be assigned different materials depending on their you know learning uh, 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 depending on their stage of learning so it is fairly sophisticated the lms tracks both their knowledge and skills through testing and artificial intelligence uh, interactivity and there by you know you the learning material that the student uh, uses is a combination of video audio text game simulation so it is not just an online delivery of education it is customizing how we are looking at uh, 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 depending on the stage where the, the student is now if one look at the drivers in the indian market uh, there is of course the need of the continuous professional development there is a strong english language vernacular because of which there is a strong demand on the you know uh, need for online education obviously the spread of internet and mobile uh, networks i mean if i put a number at present there are 350 million smartphone users which is expected to reach to about 860 by 2022 so huge mobile penetration happening in the near term and then if you combine that with a you know high quality bandwidth typically it is fairly standardized in the bigger cities obviously there is differential uh, as we move to tier 2 and tier 3 cities and that is the reason you know uh, 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 despite having uh, platforms like zoom microsoft teams or skype or google or what not still teachers record uh, uh, their sessions and offer through whatsapp so the idea is that the demand is there the government programming through the new education policy that was touched upon so it is definitely there so it's about finding that right uh, mix and you know the right fit between canadian service provider or indian service provider to work collaboratively and tap onto this opportunity and expand the bilateral relationship beyond the pure academic side of it thank you so that uh... thank you anuj uh, for your comments on the bilateral piece uh, can i just move on to nick uh, uh, nick is sitting in singapore and uh, for his opening remarks Thank you, uh, Rontu, and uh, good morning, everybody. Let me thank everybody uh, for giving up their time to be with us today, and obviously, a big thanks to ICBC uh, for organizing this uh, this event, and of course to my esteemed panelist colleagues uh, for joining us uh, for the event. Um, You know, it's interesting. Uh, we've heard from uh, everybody about uh, you know what has happened in terms of the pandemic and what it's actually created, and not only in India but obviously all around the world. And uh, my role, looking after the D2L business across Asia, uh, you know, similar things have happened in many other countries within uh, within the Asia uh, region. Um, Obviously, many schools and institutions in India had to react to the pandemic. 
Um, you know, it was a flurry of video calls and distribution of soft copy materials uh, just to maintain a sense of uh, delivering classes. And, you know, it's interesting, as I'm sure my esteemed colleagues will, will agree, uh, those particularly directly involved in education, teaching is not necessarily learning. Uh, and of course, with the advent of all schools having to go online, uh, many have opted for the quick short-term approach by using video conferencing products like Zoom, we're using it today, uh, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, to try to replicate the face-to-face -face class experience by delivering the same classes uh, using those tools. And the reality is that while teachers are teaching, you can't guarantee that students are actually learning. So it's very important to understand what the tools and technologies are that are available for teachers to be able to deliver an outstanding learning experience to their students online. Um, I don't think it's necessarily been the best experience while transiting to going online, given the abruptness of the circumstances, but I feel it served as an accelerator, an accelerator for India to explore having education online, given its market size and given its maturity in education. And of course, what technology provisions for is the added opportunity to respond flexibly rather than being forced to react. And even for some of our customers who were already conducting partial uh, lessons online, they too had to adjust operationally, but they could expand on what they already had set up. So a, a good example would be Singapore Management University here in Singapore, who we've been working with for the last 10 or so years. Um, they, uh, they went through a phase of having to move examinations to remotely, 100% remotely online. But uh, they were able to have that option because they were already conducting online examinations on campus. That's their method of delivering uh, their, uh, their examinations. And so the move to having to do them 100% remotely was simply an adjustment in what they already had. And that was an interesting experience to see. So while there are many schools and institutions that still feel going online is just a stopgap measure to the pandemic, there are obviously, as, as uh, my colleagues have mentioned, there are many long-term benefits to leveraging on technology in this day and age. And bearing in mind that technology is always evolving and improving, this is always, this is also a reason why you'll hear stories of schools and universities moving online and obviously not moving back to be fully offline. And I think just to conclude, there are three more specific points I'd like to make. Uh, and Anuj uh, just touched on it a minute ago. Um, you know, one of the most important pieces of the teaching and learning scenario when you're using technology is around engagement and personalization. If you want to make sure you're teaching effectively, then you have to engage your students and the technologies have to enable you to engage those students and also enable you to personalize that interaction. You know, there is a marriage between academia and technology and a lot of technologists don't understand academia. A lot of academics obviously don't understand technology. And in order to create a platform or a technology that's going to be incredibly powerful to use for the institution, that marriage has to happen. And typically it sits in a skill set that you probably know called education technology or ed tech. Uh, and, the inst and the art of learning design, instructional design, et cetera, et cetera. But that marriage is very, very important to be effective in, in creating that level of engagement and personalization. And um, Professor Anil uh, mentioned 
what I would class as faculty adoption, which is training. So being able to deliver the right level of training to the faculty to create a very high level of adoption of the technology is the only way that you are actually able to deliver that technology to all of the students. We find with many of our customers around the world that the biggest challenge is faculty using the technology. And if the faculty or teachers don't use the technology, how can it get to the students? It can't. Um, so that's absolutely critical. And so being able to develop faculty training programs to understand how a teacher's role when they're using technology moves to much more of a facilitation role than a traditional face-to-face -face teaching role is obviously a very, very important part of the puzzle. Thank you, Rontu. Thanks, Nick. Uh, interesting the marriage between academy and technology that you touched upon. Uh, I can see a professor is making my life here as a moderator because he's answering some questions which have popped up. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, could I now move to Vanita in our uh, Q&A uh, round? Uh, so Vanita, uh, you did speak about uh, the lockdown experience for DPS. So going forward, how, does, uh, how do you think DPS would help its students master the expanding horizons of technology? I, I think um, we've already started. One, of course, I would like to say here that um, however much the teachers may learn, we'll always be a step behind the students. They seem to be much ahead of us. Um, so we, uh, the teachers, you know, in every school, we have the center that I'm looking after. We sort of get everybody there on board and we try to help. We did sessions for online tool teaching and stuff. But every school also does its um, training of the teachers. And then, of course, they train the, the students. So I think, and, and like I said, you know, with the exchange of ideas, whether it's between the teachers or whether it's, if it's, if it's between countries like we did, it's, it's amazing. Um, so having these kind of sessions that we, like we're having right now with the teachers talking, the students being participating in it, we're looking forward to a, a lot more information coming in from all the schools. And of course, anything that we have, we share and we ask the, the teachers to share with each other. And I think that would go a long way in. And of course, like I said, schools will have to have to increase on the um, technology that was being used in the schools earlier. I mean, we were using smart boards, yes, but then now it's the time to go even further and experiment with more things. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shashiputi, if I can uh, turn to you now. Uh, we touched upon the NEP 2020 and you touched upon it too. And that's a very important document for India going forward. Uh, so the NEP 2020 emphasizes the use of technology in education. Uh, a lot lots of thought is written there. So in, in your opinion, in which areas of learning can technology most efficiently and effectively be implemented? Uh, Professor, you're uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, I was just unmuting. Uh, I think technology is very useful in almost all possible ways, except where very high-end experiments are to be conducted on the live equipment. Except for that, technology is uh, able to give you solution for everything. For example, any theory course can be easily taught as effectively in a classroom as uh, in the case of uh, online mode. The only problem which comes in is, uh, I've re replied in one of the places, is the assurance of the internet connectivity, stable, uninterrupted, which is very, very valuable. And this has to be there at every nook and corner of the country where the students are going to be there. And that is one area which needs to be addressed by the government at the fastest possible rate. The second part is uh, teachers have a role. For example, in a classroom, if a student gets a doubt, immediately he can raise the hand and satisfy his thirst for knowledge by asking a query and then get satisfied. But in an online, if he gets into some kind of a doubt, there must be a mechanism of addressing that at as fast a rate as possible. So suppose it is through an SMS, WhatsApp, email, or a blog. I think this should not wait for a long time. That inquisitiveness which is there in the mind of any student for learning something new which he has not understood, there should not be a gap. You know, that should be 
within some minutes hour at least for within a day if it is not there his thirst for that knowledge will be not satisfied and then he will move away from the online business he says that is not useful so i think that is very very significant when it comes to teachers answering the queries of the students as fast as possible as quickly as possible i think this is one area which we will have to address and train the teachers and that's why we have uh, eight module you see we didn't know that pandemic could occur please remember some of the innovative activities which aict started 3 years back they are all becoming useful today we have a mandatory teacher certification program for higher technical education there are eight modules one of the module is about use of technology in education i think teachers are have to do it's almost like a three credit course all these eight modules together is a semester long 24 credit program unless you go through that then practice for one semester go to an industry for internship you will not become a regular faculty you know tenure faculty in the us and canadian sense but in our india we call them as regular faculty or permanent faculty and you cannot become one and i think that is a big change transformation that people have started engaging more than 50000 teachers have done half of these eight modules they have to complete all the eight modules and only then they will become regular faculty Thank you, thank you, Professor. If I can move to Dr. Saha now, uh, Sir, you uh, in terms of the CBC exam system itself, what sort of technological changes has that undergone? As far as board examination is concerned, at this stage, of course, uh, we are uh, going uh, as it was uh, in previous year, but uh, with the policy directives, that is, new education policy directives. We are planning to conduct uh, that uh, competency-based assessment for class three, five, and eight, uh, maybe from uh, 2021 or subsequently uh, in a regular mode from 2022. So in such case, there will be more drive on technology. Of course, the OMR base and other options would be available for the uh, remote part of the country and where accessibility, internet, and other issues would, uh, we are going to face. But majorly, we are going to depend on that uh, technology-based exams. The second one is, of course, uh, central uh, teacher's eligibility test, which uh, CBSC is conducting at this stage. So they are, again, uh, maybe from the, uh, the next assessment or maybe from the next uh, the, uh, date, we are planning to conduct say, in an online mode. Similarly, gradually for, for the board examinations, because the policy talks about uh, to uh, um, break and uh, to make the assessment stress-free. So they are again, uh, that semester pattern may come into being uh, in even in uh, school education. So for uh, class nine, there would be two semester. So subsequently for all higher classes, it would be in two semester pattern. So if board conduct assessment in a semester way, so definitely the technology interventions will be there, maybe for the initially for the objective and later on gradually in coming uh, five to 10 years, we need to depend on the technology to give more transparency and also remove the because uh, that lengthy uh, time schedule uh, for assessment or even for the prodigy, maybe there, there would be a special mechanisms to con on demand examination. So these kind of things are already uh, in our plate. We are uh, trying to discuss and offer to our stakeholder. And maybe gradually after taking the input from the school leaders and uh, different use case and pilot uh, testing would be there. And thereafter only, it would be a huge reality for the entire nation in CBC schools. Thank you. That's interesting. So, uh, if I can now move to Anuj. Um, Anuj, you did... Um, that gave give an overview of the Canada India education relationship. So, where do you see opportunities for collaboration between the two countries in the ed tech space uh, specifically? So, uh, thanks, Tonto. Uh, I mean, it's across the board. You look at the content or the curriculum side of it. Uh, uh, some part of it is definitely offline. Majority of it would be offline, but a lot can be offered online. Uh, Ten odd percent of a you know thing. Uh, assessment is one big area where uh, you know edtech can contribute uh, significantly. Uh, 
we talked about the workplace uh, solutions for continuous uh, professional development so again uh, technology uh, specially driven by ai can be a big driver to provide customized uh, learning outcomes for people who are looking to upskill themselves uh, uh, then uh, uh, even uh, you know purely from an access uh, standpoint uh, setting up virtual classrooms uh, where you have pre recorded sessions and sort of you know uh, a, an exchange which can reach out to the remotest part of the country so there again uh, one can look at uh, collaborating even you know uh, looking at micro credentials or nano credentials whatever be the uh, uh, you know r- 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 lingo that one can look at some part of the complete certificate if achieved online that credential can be offered to the student to encourage uh, 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 that mode of learning we've had examples like d2l has been working quite extensively with a number of institution in southern india there are cases of uh, again a canadian company by the name uh, um, uh, skill stocks uh, uh, which so they have uh, they they offer a lot of uh, certificate programs uh, where consolidating co- content from universities colleges and even schools and offer it uh, through an online medium at a k to 12 level on you know on by the time the physical mobility doesn't happen online gives a very good uh, opportunity for the teachers to engage share best practices how the learning outcomes are being achieved so both ways uh, uh, that can be shared so the opportunities are tremendous it is only about us getting out of that comfort zone and you know the as they say the looking beyond the low hanging fruits of student recruitment or academic partnerships and try and get into this service provider board where both sides not only canada even india both sides have a equal tangible uh, uh, outcome out of it okay thank you thank you anuj uh, if i can move to uh, nick uh, now uh, nick you know given your global experience in next gen <laughs> online teaching and learning uh, how do you think a robust uh, uh, lms uh, learning management system support the objectives of nep uh going for or uh, moving forward um <clears throat> thanks on to um one of the key focus areas in the nep is obviously around the shift from traditional rote learning to applications or skill based learning um and and what that does is to allow students to have more flexibility in the way they want to develop their education path um you know it's a major change for many traditional institutions however it's it's more about a gradual evolution of curriculums and adapting to the opportunities through the new policy um and i think it's a crucial consideration for both schools and universities in india to make the transition to online learning along with standard classroom learning so we're looking at a potentially complementary blended approach uh, it was mentioned earlier on flipped classroom hybrid teaching hybrid learning etc um so i mean if you think about children um you know it's about learning through physical play stimulating uh, tactile senses with college students it's very much about being able to read in person social and physical cues uh, that facilitate the overall learning experience and then prepare them for the workforce both locally and overseas and of course at the same time they still need to know what ammonia smells like in a in a chemistry lab right um so what technology brings to the table for schools and institutions i think is the ability to leverage on the capabilities for learning for better learning outcomes uh, better metrics uh, better alignment with overall institutional objectives which might be you know 100% passing rates 100% placement uh, but all of these are paving the way for uh, the nation to build through a holistic approach to education Uh, and i think to achieve that schools and institutions need to understand 
that there is not a one size fits all approach for effective learning. Uh, hence, you can't put students in one classroom and expect all students to perform the same. Uh, it's about catering to how they learn and what they're interested in, rather than just adding on remedial time for them to learn. Um, you know, a sophisticated learning platform enables the institution to structure learning according to the needs and preferences of individual students. If a student seems to be struggling with a unit on a course, it means he or she isn't ready necessarily to advance to the next unit yet. The technology can be set to automatically serve alternative forms of course content of the same topic to supplement that learning. And, you know, we're in a world where it's no longer just about text notes. Uh, we're looking at a myriad of animated videos, interactive content, bite-sized videos, gamified content, all very relevant forms of content that we consume today. And, and with technology, students in the same course can choose what they want to learn as, if you like, a sub-course. If it's something they like, it's more likely that they'll excel in it. Uh, what I was saying earlier on about engagement and personalization. Uh, and, and not to mention, it'll give them, you know, a sense of motivation to continue on in their overall course while gaining that knowledge in something they enjoy. So where we do well with Brightspace, for example, is our focus on lifelong learning. And I think this is something that is very relevant to India. We're a, an education-centered company, and we believe that learning does not stop at the foundational school years. You know, we have a, a, an interesting example, Federal Express or FedEx, as you would know it, uh, is a customer of ours in North America in the US. Uh, they're centered uh, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and they partnered with another customer of ours in Memphis, which is the University of Memphis. Um, uh, they're also, as I said, a Brightspace user. Their, their objective from this partnership is to ensure that the employees of FedEx have access to how and what they want to learn and upskill on. And so the staff are motivated at the opportunities that are given to them. And FedEx actually saw an increase in staff retention rate as well as a result of that relationship and what was delivered to what the staff wanted to learn and get involved in with their skill uh, uplifting. So, I mean, at the end of the day, going online doesn't mean faculty members have to spend time teaching individual. I mean, all of this can be automated with technology. Uh, AI was mentioned, so AI can be set to identify and place students on different learning paths of their choosing and according to their mastery levels. And all of the information on individual and cohort performances can be made available at the fingertips of faculty members through a single dashboard. Uh, and, and that's important because it means that the, the teachers can then exercise flexibility on how they would want to help students falling behind. They get immediate access to that. They know how a student is performing immediately, which is not an easy thing to do when you're teaching a a class of 50 students, right? Um, and obviously there's always option for synchronous or asynchronous vi virtual classrooms too. Um, and through one platform for greater efficiency and to obviously optimize the experience for anybody uh, and everybody. Um, so at the end of the day, it's about identifying the institutional goals and finding the right teaching and learning tools that enable the institution to achieve those goals while streamlining the work processes of the teaching staff and the faculty. And obviously all of this is uh, possible if you have the right technology. Thank you, Nick, uh, uh, for that. Uh, I think now uh, we, uh, we have a short presentation from Nick uh, and the way we'll play it is uh, if you can keep it within five to seven minutes, uh, Nick, uh, then we may have a quick uh, rapid fire round of questions. Uh, I'll see if there's anything from the web chat in the meanwhile, and then we can close with uh, Adira. Okay, thank you, uh, Rantu. I'll just uh, quickly share my screen. <clears throat> 
Okay, so uh, I'll move this uh, through this relatively quickly. Um, so before I talk a little bit about transforming or the transformation of learning that is happening and affecting all of us, what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about the company that I represent, D2L, Desire to Learn, uh, as has been mentioned a couple of times today. Uh, this is the organization that created Brightspace, one of the uh, leading learning management systems globally. We were founded uh, 21 years ago in 1999 on the eastern seaboard of Canada, quite close to Toronto. Uh, we were founded by a gentleman called John Baker, who had just graduated with a, an engineering degree from the University of Waterloo. John's parents are educators and his grandparents were educators. And he, when he graduated, he wanted to create an organization that would focus on education on a global scale. So he came up with a mission statement, which is still our objective today. And John is still our CEO 21 years uh, later. Uh, and that statement was and is to transform the way the world learns using the smart application of technology. So 21 years later, we have about uh, or in excess of 1500 customers around the world. And we have around about 15 plus million learners or users using the learning management system Brightspace uh, at this moment in time. Our legacy is very much higher education. Uh, that's where we started. The majority or a large number of our customers are still uh, from the higher education space. We moved very quickly into K-12 schools uh, and, uh, uh, and started to work with a lot of schools around the world as well, and then into other segments, if you, if you like. Um, <clears throat> We are very much a teaching and learning organization. That's what we focus on on a daily basis, to understand the latest pedagogical trends and styles around the world, and then build them into the tools and the activities that sit on the technology platform, and then enable teachers to enhance the way in which they're teaching, and obviously enable learners and students to get to better outcomes. So we put pedagogy first, and we put technology second. Technology is very much the enabler of what we do. Just to give you an idea of where we are uh, in, uh, in India, uh, this is our presence in India today. Um, and obviously with what we've experienced with one of our customers, uh, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, uh, Brightspace, the Brightspace LMS is uh, fully UGC online compliant or a fully UGC online compliant platform, which means to institutions, even if they don't require the accreditation right now for going online, uh, that they are obviously prepared for the future. Our customers in India also include XLRI, uh, based in Jamshapur, as you know, and a number of interesting school groups uh, that we're working with. Um, we currently have two uh, D2L uh, staff, uh, Dr. Prem Mahashwari, uh, Business Director for South Asia, is based in Delhi, and Mahesh Submaranian, Sub who's our Senior Solutions Engineer, based down in Chennai, Chennai. As importantly, we have a very strong relationship with an organization called EduTech India. Uh, EduTech India are renowned experts in this field and a leading provider of EdTech solutions across India. And they're based across India in six cities. So that gives us a lot of local support, local interaction, advisory services, et cetera, that we, that we need to have. And we're currently looking at expanding our base uh, in India. In terms of other organizations we work with, um, on the left, you'll see fully online institutions, typically North America, but some in Europe, um, where they're allowed and accredited to deliver fully online. Southern New Hampshire University is probably the largest fully online university in North America, with 130,000 students sitting on uh, the Brightspace platform. The ones in the middle are the blended or hybrid uh, institutions that work with our technology. So they, they use the technology to support face-to-face -face delivery as well as using the technology to enable students to do work outside of class and faculty to be able to use the technology outside of class as well. Uh, the ones on the right are community college or vocational training colleges, uh, a lot of whom we work with. Uh, schools, uh, again, online in North America, virtual schools as they call them is a very big part of 
of, 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 of the school's activity. We work with about 60% of them, so we're very heavy into that area, plus blended schools and large school boards that we work with uh, as well. Um, so just quickly in the last few minutes that I've got, um, students have changed. If you've been in education for a while, this isn't news to you, but what, what exactly does that mean? First, it means that those traditional students, the ones coming right out of high school and entering college are different today than they were 10 or even five years ago. And today's students expect to use whatever devices they choose to access learning content, take notes, gather data, and communicate frequently with their peers and their instructors or their teachers. And more than 70% of Generation Z students think it's important to be able to design their own course of study. And they prefer to learn on their own time in their own way. Uh, and Gen Z seek education and knowledge in real time. Uh, they use social media channels as forms of research. And if they could, they would probably multitask across uh, five screens. And more students today tend to start working earlier. They leave school without going to college, typically because they need to start working. There is a growing number that then want to go to college to obtain their degree, to enhance their ability to get a better job. Uh, and this is tough, given that they have to juggle their work and probably their family, uh, what is known as the work-life-learn balance. So consequently, they need flexibility in their education. And students today are used to being served what's relevant to them, even before they know about it, from Amazon to Netflix and everything in between. And this is very exhausting for teachers to keep tabs on every student's needs in the classroom, unless, of course, technology is used uh, to achieve this. This is an example of a fully web responsive or mobile responsive teaching and learning interface where the full LMS is available across any device, regardless of size operating system or age of device, giving both faculty, teachers and students the ability to access the LMS, the full learning management system at any time uh, and obviously from anywhere. And being fully web responsive is becoming a key, key criteria when you're using technology to support the delivery of teaching and learning. And with the rising need for flexible education uh, options comes the appeal of massive open online courses and other online education alternatives that are often free. So how do traditional schools and universities then stay competitive? Well, social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, blogs, YouTube, and others, which were initially known as mere info entertainment spaces, have already become new learning spaces for interaction amongst students and teachers, idea sharing, tutoring, and training, just like the learning spaces in the traditional classroom. And the World Wide Web, of course, allows connectivity and communication, which means students have options with what, with what they want to learn, and teachers have the option of what they want to teach without having to consider geographic location. The options for both students and teachers have become absolutely unlimited. And the key, of course, is adopting technology that will allow you to deliver engaging education experiences at scale while making it more accessible for more learners. So think about what you would do if uh, you had the data to know exactly how well each learner was progressing in real time and could quickly identify which students are at risk and then put in place a more efficient learning path for them to get to the best possible outcome. However, uh, and I think the educators amongst us will, 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 will agree, uh, I think we all know that great technology alone isn't nearly enough. The magic happens when talented, innovative, and dedicated educators get their hands on innovative tools and take advantage of new ways of teaching to deliver engaging, effective learning experiences to more people. So just before I finish, what I'd like to do is to, uh, uh, you've heard me talk a little bit about uh, Brightspace and who we are. Uh, if you're curious about uh, how Brightspace looks and how it could potentially support your school or university's go uh, goals, uh, we have a series of three 
uh, of 30 minute demos, web demo webinars lined up next week. Uh, my colleague Jacqueline uh, has just put the link in the chat for you, chat for you to register for them. Uh, our solutions engineers will be conducting these sessions, demonstrating how Brightspace facilitates the different needs of institutions. Uh, and you can obviously ask some questions about the platform during the sessions. So do sign up for them. Even if you can't attend, uh, you'll receive a copy of the recording after the sessions. Thank you, Rontu. Uh, thanks, Nick. I just saw from the web chat, uh, uh, there was a question from Priyanka and how can you empower school teachers? I guess some of it was embedded in your presentation. And uh, Vanessa was asking about sharing the PowerPoint, uh, but the uh, session is recorded. So there will be a link provided to all the registrants and they can view the PowerPoint uh, while viewing the session. Uh, so uh, if I can just very uh, quickly close with one quick question to uh, Benita, uh, Professor Shashpute and uh, Dr. Saha. Uh, very briefly, in your opinion, in the context of India is online schooling and uh, methods of communication, is it raising inequality? Benita, you can go first. Yes, you're on mute. I, I, could you just repeat the last uh, I was saying in the context of India is online schooling and the whole online <laughs> revolution, is it raising inequality? Uh, I guess the problem is there where um, everybody doesn't have access to um, technology to be able to um, get on to the online classes. But I really, very frankly, don't see it as a problem in the future. It came up all of a sudden. We were not maybe prepared to deal with it. I'm sure there are solutions there. I mean, you know, there are there are people, I mean, schools are helping out, schools are giving uh, handouts or schools, some schools have even um, started asking parents and maybe um, NGOs to help out with giving, um, you know, uh, mobile phones or tabs to um, uh, tablets to children. So I actually think that um, the kind of glitches or the kind of hitches we saw right now, yes, we did. Um, I, I'm, I'm positive it'll be smoothened out. I think we'll be, we are getting more prepared. And, and this is a policy which the government can take. And I think everybody who is into this field, we, we can sort of work a solution to this. So I don't think it's going to be something which is long lasting. That's positive, uh, Manika. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shashabhutte, from the higher education perspective, uh, do you see this as a problem? So, uh, this is problem for both primary as well as higher education, as long as we look at it in the right perspective. First and foremost, we were all taken by a shock, actually, of the COVID-19 crisis, and everything started becoming online. And our uh, uh, internet connectivity to the nooks and corners, whether it is fiber optic uh, cable, which was laid, uh, was not uh, to all the villages everywhere. Secondly, the bandwidth which was available, if it is, say, 10 you know, the terabyte of uh, connection is there, and 100 users were there. Now, if they become 1,000 or 10,000, naturally, from a pipeline where water is being supplied, if uh, more connections are taken, the quantity of water coming to your house will reduce. So there is a problem even in Delhi today because the number of users during the pandemic increased suddenly. So this issue can be certainly technologically solved. It will take a couple of months because every labor activity was also stopped. So laying a fiber line and I, I, you know increasing the bandwidth will take a little more time, but certainly that is a positive thing which is possible. The second one which uh, Vanita has already talked about is the devices. The second issue comes to those who are able to afford buying those devices, they have no problem. But those who cannot afford to buy devices, how does government support them in terms of very uh, bottom of the pyramid people, one, or the CSR activity of the industry, the various people like us, actually middle class. Every home has at least five mobile uh, smartphones lying idle because when a model changes, we keep on uh, buying a new one. Why can't we donate the remaining four, which is lying at our homes? Let us have a library in every institution. All those students and alumni can come and donate. And those who cannot afford to buy a mobile phone, they can be given. If there is a small fee required for fixing it, you know, if it's not working fine, we can even do that, actually. I think 
we can really make this as a very 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 important thing to do if you do that probably this will reduce the actually the disparity that exists for disparity which is already existing in terms of brick and mortar infrastructure which is very very expensive this is a much lower cost uh, and then still you will be able to reach out to more people i think we should take it from that positive angle and it should all of us work together i think why 50% gross enrollment ratio in higher education we can even reach 60% many of the courses can become online thank you professor excellent suggestion on the phones uh, dr saab uh, your thoughts uh, very briefly uh, may not be a direct answer Uh, because uh, the real situation is known to all the panelists and the viewers uh, so uh, there is a huge move from the side of the government uh, to minimize that uh, digital divide but uh, as a representative from the school educations i can say that technology is not only solution india is aiming for we have huge number of teachers and more and more other connectivity issues so maybe for pandemic times certain difficulty faced by some of our stakeholder of course it's a reality but at the same time there are different mechanism is uh, going on to address all these issues and that's why uh, in my initial comment i try to put that uh, radio podcast and your um, televisions many state is actually using it effectively to reach last mile so these issues is there or differently it will be there 100% uh, uh, connectivity issues cannot be resolved overnight or within a span of a year but we have to live with the reality and those who are who have faced that opportunity loss i believe the teachers community and school leader and even from the higher education institutes they are trying to compensate these issues differently and that's why more and more low cost and uh, digital devices as well as uh, digital modules both for lab based activities and other things are highly required across the globe and how it can be utilized i think uh, nick can definitely uh, take it forwards from from this journey and come up with uh, different solutions of course the government initiatives is also there to bring a uh, freebies so that actually we can reach to every household in the country thank, thank you. you thank you thank you dr sahas so uh, thank you all uh, the panelists and uh, we even had uh, someone uh, dominic breakley from the university of new brunswick joining he must have woken up at 2 am in the morning to join this webinar so it does show some enthusiasm uh, for the session today uh, but thank you uh each one of you vanita professor shashtrapute anuraj uh nick uh, dr saha and nidzi i'll hand it back now to nadira for her closing comments thank you rontu and i echo rontu's thanks a word from my side uh thank you to lindsay for coming in and making those special opening remarks uh thank you to professor sahasrabude dr saha ms vanita sagal mr nick hatton and anuj basin uh this was a very engaging and interesting interaction and i'm sure our viewers uh, would be very happy with this and probably see the opportunities uh, present in this discussion so as we said today is the day of transformation today is the time for digitization and uh, the education sector should be the one to benefit from it the most uh, because a good education makes for good students and good students make for a better world and that is what we are all aiming at i'm sure there are you know there are problems as were pointed out in this new method of teaching but there are also so many uh, solutions and so many opportunities in this so let us take that and go ahead uh, for a better tomorrow um, all of you thank you very much once again stay safe and stay healthy all the best and i must uh, thank rontu for steering this conversation so well thank you rontu thank you thank you very much bye, -bye everyone have a good day bye, take care bye bye thank you bye bye thank you bye bye